Hey everybody, uh, welcome back. This is Mr. Miller once again. Uh, a couple days ago I introduced myself uh, in a different video to my government class and then I was like, wait a second, I guess I probably don't have to introduce myself uh, anyways. That is unimportant. Uh, we made it through another day. Uh, we got three up there on the uh, on the counter, so we're doing well. Uh, hopefully we keep it going. Uh, obviously we hope that we keep it going, uh, but yeah. Uh, everybody needs to stay safe and stay healthy and not uh, not get sick. Uh, and if they do, they need to need to uh, stay away from other people, but also seek the proper medical help uh, if they do get sick. But uh, I'm down here in my uh, coronavirus bunker, so I'm not going to get sick, hopefully. So uh, that is the plan. Uh, today, our goal is to wrap up our uh, topic 13 notes. Uh, we are on number 10, or we just wrapped up number 10 yesterday. Uh, so our goal is to get through uh, the rest of it from 11 to 16. Uh, I'm not quite sure exactly what I would do to like have a test on this virtual space. So instead of that, we're kind of just going to kind of move on but uh, I did uh, tomorrow you'll you'll see and I'll post a video with this uh, with the information about this but uh, tomorrow's activity will essentially be working on the crossword uh, for the entire class so I'll post a short video explaining uh, explaining kind of the idea with that it's going to be a little bit different uh, without being able to turn that in uh, so you'll have to kind of do that virtually but uh, we'll make do with that but that's going to be kind of our wrap up for the uh, for the course or for the the topic, uh, but it's going to be everybody's going to do it. It's not going to be uh, not going to be an extra credit option uh, anymore. So uh, that's the deal for tomorrow. Uh, but then next week we'll get into our next topic, topic fourteen, uh, which is World War Two uh, and America's involvement in that. But uh, before we get there, we got to wrap up this uh, Great Depression time period. So. Uh, without further ado, where we had left off yesterday uh, was number 10 here. Uh, I realized that I did not talk about uh, these political cartoons that I had for number 10, so uh, I feel like I should probably do that. Uh, this uh, political cartoon here uh, is talking about Roosevelt's court packing plan, obviously, since that's the slide it's on, uh, but it is uh, kind of showing how FDR is trying to get people who are, you know, just kind of yes, yes, yes men, I guess you might say, um, get yes men out of the Supreme Court. Uh, essentially what's going on here is, is you've got Uncle Sam uh, sitting at his desk. You've got FDR pictured there uh, and he's got five people sitting on his knee. Uh, but they are uh, like dummies, puppets. Uh, he's a ventriloquist is what it says in the title. Uh, so Essentially, FDR is uh, telling all of them exactly how he wants them to vote on everything, as a ventriloquist does. It puts words in uh, in the dummy's mouth. Uh, so FDR is there controlling five of these dummies uh, and basically telling them exactly how he wants them to vote. So uh, the, the caption there, do we want a ventriloquist act in the Supreme Court? Uh, most people said, no, we don't. Now, this next uh, political cartoon, uh, the title here is Step by Step. Uh, this one's interesting, too. So, so it shows FDR. It shows on his, uh, on his uh, jacket. It says FDR, and he's using a cane. Uh, but FDR there is uh, walking, up, uh, walking up these stairs, these platforms, uh, up to uh, the final spot, which is not a great spot to be. It's a dictator. Uh, so he's going from government reorganization, uh, changing around the government's organization, uh, then revising how the Supreme Court runs, adding new judges on there, uh, and then the next step up there is to become a dictator, which uh, this is definitely a negative perspective of FDR as he's uh, kind of taking on the role of uh, gathering a lot of power and what what sorts of people usually do that? Dictators. So that's kind of what this... Uh, what this person is uh, saying here in this cartoon. Um, I realized that uh, I just mentioned again FDR using a cane. Um, FDR, and I, I had said that I would talk about this at a later point, so I guess I better talk about it now. Uh, FDR had uh, polio, uh, which is a uh, crippling disease. Uh, it makes it so that you really can't walk. Uh, so he had polio. Uh, the 
strange thing about it was that uh, very few people uh, of the general American public actually knew that he had polio. Uh, the story goes is that uh, they wanted to, I guess his administration kind of wanted to uh, kind of give off a feeling of uh, authority with the president, wanted the president to feel like, uh, or wanted the American people to feel like the president was a leader and a powerful person. Uh, the assumption was that the president could not have that image uh, if he was viewed as somebody who needed to be wheeled around in a wheelchair constantly. Uh, I think that that's probably an old school way of thinking about it. Uh, I think that uh, nowadays, I think it would be probably different, uh, but I don't think it's necessarily uh, completely different in that uh, you would want somebody to be a really strong leader. and. Uh, Somebody who's, uh, somebody who's dealing with some sort of disability like that would have a hard time uh, kind of proving, uh, proving that to, I guess, uh, ignorant people, uh, I might say. So uh, what they do is they basically uh, pretend that he's not, uh, not disabled at all. Uh, so they uh, essentially, whenever he had to walk anywhere, he would have a cane or have people by his side. Uh, the media would uh, the newspaper reporters and uh, that sort of that, that sort of group of people, uh, they were very cautious to never take pictures of him being uh, wheeled around uh, in his wheelchair or pushed around in his wheelchair um, unless they were private photos. So there were a couple private photos that have existed uh, that have been uh, kind of shown uh, in recent years. But the idea was to show a, a, a sign of strength uh, as the country. Now, again, uh, I think things would be different today. I at least hope they would be. But uh, back then, they did not want uh, a president to be shown as not being able to walk. Um, so that is kind of, it is what it is. But uh, again, kind of interesting at the very least. So um, we're going to move on to number 11. Okay, number 11. Uh, economic setbacks here. Uh, in the middle of the Great Depression, obviously the New Deal has been around. The New Deal, uh, the I guess the idea behind the New Deal is to try to drag uh, the United States out of the Depression. So with this New Deal, uh, we see a drop in unemployment. We see uh, some improvements in terms of how the economy is operating. Uh, so you can see here uh, on this uh, chart over here, I've got my cursor over here. So you've got uh, very low unemployment, uh, like 4%, 3 4% uh, right when the stock market crashes. Stock market crashes within three years. It's up to 25%, like we had mentioned in class last week. Very quickly thereafter, uh, FDR is trying to lower the unemployment rates. So he ends up uh, passing these New Deal laws, putting millions of people back to work. Uh, the unemployment rate does not drop as much as you probably think it should. Uh, the unemployment rate is still, by 1937, four years into this New Deal, uh, it's still over 15%, which is a very, very high uh, unemployment rate. Uh, it is about three times as high as, it is, as the unemployment rate is today in America. Uh, we are at about 4%, uh, so it's almost, almost uh, four times as high. Um, I don't know how that will change given the current economic situation, but currently we're at 4%. Uh, give or take. So, uh, and interestingly enough, uh, the unemployment rate rises in the middle of this New Deal in some cases. Uh, so it rises up in between 1937 and 1938, almost back up to 20%. Uh, so what ends up kind of being the reason for that is uh, FDR sees that the, uh, that the government is helping and that the economy is growing. So what does he do? He starts getting a little nervous that we're spending too much money. So it cuts back a little bit, cuts back on the money that we're, uh, that we're putting towards this uh, depression. Then uh, the uh, unemployment shoots right back up almost to 20% uh, within, a, within a year. Uh, so there you're at uh, 1937, 38, uh, we're bumping back up to almost 20%. Uh, the economy doesn't kind of spirals out of control, but not as bad as it was at the very, the very beginning of the depression. Uh, but the economy, it, it kind of proves that, okay, whatever whatever we had fixed, it's not completely done. Uh, whatever we had uh, tried to fix, uh, they did not work entirely perfectly. Uh, so ultimately, kind of this, this shows um, what I guess kind of a big debate in, in American history is, okay, what, what gets America out of this depression? 
Is it the New Deal? Is it World War II? Okay, I think it's probably a combination of both. I think it'd probably be foolish to say that it's that the New Deal had no effect on the Great Depression, uh, because it obviously did when you're talking about lowering unemployment. Uh, but when you're talking about dropping unemployment back down to good levels, uh, that does not come until America gets involved in World War II and we ramp up production and all that stuff that comes with that. So uh, FDR ends up kind of stopping the New Deal after, uh, after this uh, blip in the graph here uh, in the late 1930s, uh, partly because uh, he loses some support uh, based on uh, based on his uh, economic issues that he's kind of going on, or going through right now, uh, but then also because uh, at this point we're starting to focus on World War II, even though we're not in it. So that's a bit of a preview going forward to uh, next time. So uh, going into number twelve, okay, going into number twelve, Eleanor Roosevelt. Uh, I had mentioned that Eleanor Roosevelt was uh, FDR's wife. Uh, FDR uh, it was like his second cousin, I'm pretty sure, uh, if I remember correctly. Uh, so Eleanor Roosevelt, uh, they were related nevertheless. So Eleanor Roosevelt, she is uh, in the position of uh, the president's wife, which I have written up here. Uh, the name that we give to the president's wife has always been the first lady. Uh, so you probably knew that or probably have heard of it before. Uh, but uh, that's what we call the president's wife, I guess. So in, uh, as Eleanor Roosevelt becomes the first lady or in her, in her time as first lady, uh, what does she do? Uh, she does probably more than any other person, uh, any other first lady in American history uh, before her and maybe afterwards. Uh, she does more to change the role of the first lady uh, than anyone who had come before her. What I mean by that is that uh, beforehand, uh, the first lady would have been uh, this sort of person who would just kind of sit around and uh, wave at parties and uh, do all sorts of things like that, uh, ceremonial things. Uh, at this point, though, Eleanor Roosevelt does turn this uh, turn this job, uh, this job of the first lady, uh, into a position of action. Uh, what she decides to do, she says, you know, it's not only FDR. Uh, that can go around and uh, speak to the American people. Uh, so what she does is she tours the nation, uh, goes around to a bunch of different places in the country, uh, fights for her personal goals, um, whatever she's uh, kind of advocating for. She would uh, specifically, one of her main initiatives was uh, food for people who needed it. Uh, she wanted, uh, yeah, she wanted, uh, as the saying goes, or saying one at the time, a chicken in every pot. Uh, meaning everybody should be able to have access to food if they need it. Um, she also uh, would campaign with her husband, which is something that wouldn't have happened really before this, uh, go out with FDR and uh, go go on the campaign trail. Uh, there is also uh, a newspaper column. She writes a newspaper column every single day talking to American people. So similar to what F FDR did with his, uh, with his fireside chats, uh, Eleanor Roosevelt is really fighting for things that she is uh, she is uh, kind of passionate about. Uh, some of her other things I've written down here on the master notes, if you're looking at those, uh, public health, uh, education, uh, those sorts of areas. Uh, I also have written down there, she traveled over 60,000 miles in two years uh, just uh, to visit other parts of the country, 60,000 miles. Uh, the country is only like 3,000 miles across from me, or across. Uh, so from east to west, that is uh, impressive, 60,000 miles in two years. Uh, here you've got a picture of a uh, picture of her and um, I don't know, I'm just standing there. Uh, the other one, picture at a desk, she's talking on the radio there. So uh, that would have been something that FDR was known for, but also uh, she would be uh, able to be involved in too. So uh, let's move on to 13. So number 13 is kind of a, a moment here where we talk about uh, how did the New Deal change government for uh, the United States? Um, an, an important thing to mention here is that uh, most Americans had never really, before the New Deal, uh, had never experienced the government. Uh, by that I mean uh, they had not really uh, directly felt the government. What is the government doing? It's always been this far off thing 
uh, this this group that's uh, involved in our lives in some ways, but it is not a uh, it's not a situation where we feel their effects a lot. Uh, they make decisions; we're not affected by them in some cases. Uh, this changes it. Uh, we don't really understand from our perspectives in, in uh, 2020 America, we don't really understand what it's like to not feel the government. I pay taxes to the government twice a month. Uh, I abide by rules that the government sets for me. Uh, the government pays for health care for, for millions of Americans. The government pays for a lot of things. So the government is involved in our lives in ways that we we just take for granted. But at this point, they had never felt anything like that before. The government was not involved in uh, their lives in any realistic, uh, tangible touch. Uh, you can you can touch it in any way. They they weren't there really. So uh, this time though, this New Deal this changes that. Uh, all of a sudden, government is felt by normal Americans. Uh, so it is something where uh, where Americans start to really uh, understand and feel what the uh, what the government is, um, what the government's doing. Uh, there are programs that are created that are uh, very wide reaching or wide, uh, wide reaching. Yeah, I guess that's the word. Um, felt by a lot of people, uh, interacting with a lot of people. Uh, the government's providing support for a lot of Americans. Uh, and then you also have uh, a lot of power that's added through the Great Depression, through this New Deal, uh, government power. So the government grows a lot during this time. I guess that's how I would probably put it. Uh, the government grows grows substantially. So um, I think that's all I got to say for that one. Now let me move on to uh, some cultural things. Uh, if you know anything about uh, American films, you recognize that, hopefully. Uh, so there are uh, films during the Great Depression that are very, very popular. Uh, we had mentioned that during the 1920s, about 100 million Americans were seeing a film every week. Uh, they were going to the movies every week, which is a pretty high number. Uh, the number keeps on rising here. Uh, during the 1930s, uh, two out of every three Americans were going to see a movie uh, every week, at least once a week. Two out of three, which is uh, pretty high, I think, if you were to say. Uh, movies were way cheaper back then. Uh, you weren't paying uh, 14, 15 bucks uh, on a good day uh, to go watch a movie, but uh, they were still finding ways to go do this. Uh, whatever money they had, they would need to spend uh, on some leisure activities. Uh, think about this: if you are if you are going through the Great Depression and it is a hard time for you, and you come across a dollar, uh, maybe you go and you treat your family to a movie just to try to forget a little bit of the pain that is the Depression. Uh, so if you if you have any spare money, you're gonna you're gonna try to use it some way that tries to let you forget about this. Uh, and, and escape for at least two hours, something like that, you know. So that's that's kind of the the idea there. So uh, the famous uh, the famous image there uh, is from The Wizard of Oz, which I had written up here. Uh, so The Wizard of Oz uh, was originally a book, but then it's uh, made into a movie at this point. Uh, it is, uh, to my knowledge, uh, the first movie that had a little bit of color in it. Uh, there was it started out black and white, but then when uh, when Dorothy goes to the land of Oz, uh, she uh, enters into this colorful world. And uh, my understanding is that they took every single frame from the movie and colored it in by hand. Uh, and I mean, probably 60 frames or 30 frames per second. I don't know what the frame rate was was on or on those old uh, video cameras, but uh, time consuming work. Uh, but this came out right in the middle of this uh, depression. Some other famous ones I had written down here, uh, Gone with the Wind, a uh, famous book, uh, was written uh, back in, I want to say the mid-1800s, mid, mid -1800s, I'm pretty sure. Uh, it's about the pre-Civil War uh, South, um, Scarlett O'Hara, uh, maybe, that, maybe that sounds familiar to you, but uh, that's another famous book, uh, but then turned into a movie at this point, and it's kind of a, an epic movie. Um, epic in that it's it's a big movie, maybe not like an awesome movie, but uh, people like it. Uh, the last one that I should mention here is Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. Uh, Snow White's a Disney movie. Uh, Disney is making movies at this point, and uh, they're pretty popular, animated movies. Uh, these other ones were not animated. They were uh, live, not live, but uh, actors and actresses and things like that. Uh, but uh, the Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs is, uh, is a 
classic animated movie. Um, so these uh, these movies, they show kind of the challenges of the Depression. Uh, the beginning of The Wizard of Oz, to start with, uh, shows uh, Dorothy, the main character there in blue. Uh, Dorothy, uh, she is in Kansas, um, and it's in kind of Dust Bowl, uh, Depression, Kansas, which is not really that great of a, not that great of a situation. So it kind of shows, kind of shows what Americans were doing. They were escaping uh, from, uh, from the life that they had. I mean, she got out of there not by her choice. She was swept up in a tornado, but uh, it is it is an escape. It is They took you from what they knew, uh, which was the Dust Bowl, this bad time, this depression, and transported you into a new place that uh, was going to make you forget about uh, your life for uh, a couple, couple hours at least. Uh, so it's kind of interesting um, why people are going to movies at this point, but it's, it's cool. Um, Next up here, let me go on to uh, 15. So uh, 15 is uh, the Federal Art Project. Uh, the Federal Art Project is uh, a program that was put in place by FDR, uh, recognizing that different people have a bunch of different talents and whether or not those talents are building houses, whether or not those talents are painting pictures, whether or not those talents are, I don't know, anything, name, name a job that people would do before the Depression. Um, essentially, what FDR wanted to do, he said, you know, these people, uh, specifically artists, uh, artists, photographers, uh, sculptors, those sorts of people, uh, painters, uh, they had skills that were not uh, normal skills. They had skills that were not, not I guess they were they were better than uh, being used to just uh, fight forest fires, or not that that's not a big deal, but uh, better than just being used to, um, I don't know, uh, do whatever, build a tunnel, right? So these infrastructure projects that people were doing. Uh, he said, I want to put these guys to work in doing what they were doing, uh, artwork, painting, drawing, uh, photography, uh, all that stuff. I want to be able to allow for... Uh, our country to be made more beautiful because of these uh, people's contributions. So what he does, he passes this federal art project. It ends up allowing for uh, artists and painters and sculptors and photographers to do their job, do what they love to do, uh, and get paid for it by the government. Uh, so they would have government works, uh, government projects that they would be working on. So for example, uh, a, an artist, a painter, might be commissioned to go to a post office and paint a big mural in a post office uh, up on the wall just to make things a little bit more beautiful, just to make things a little bit nicer. Um, that's kind of the, the story with this federal art project. This uh, picture here um, that is on the slide uh, is a picture from the federal art project. Um, it was commissioned, I believe this is in a post office somewhere, a federal building. Uh, somewhere that uh, got got payment through the Federal Art Project. Uh, and it kind of shows uh, some New Deal jobs being done there. Now, uh, this picture here, uh, you may have seen this picture before. This is uh, one of the most famous photographs in American history. Uh, it is, uh, I'll put it up here, uh, it is by Dorothea Lange, uh, and it is Migrant Mother is the name of it. Dorothea Lange, Migrant Mother. Um... So if you got that down, um, this picture was, uh, I mean, the title is Migrant Mother. I'm going to pull it back up here. Uh, Migrant Mother, um, it was uh, taken of a lady who was traveling. Uh, my understanding is from the Dust Bowl out to the West. Uh, and Dorothea Lang was traveling along with people, uh, taking photographs of them as they went, uh, making sure, or I, I guess, just chronicling their journey. And she took this photo. Um, and and uh, this this lady becomes kind of famous for this photo. Um, so this is, like I said, the the most famous uh, Depression era uh, photo, to my knowledge, uh, is migrant mother here. Um, so that's uh, just another example, and I would be remiss if I did not at least show you this photo. So on to the last piece here, Steinbeck's Grapes of Wrath. Uh, we had already mentioned this last week. If you remember, we were talking about the... Uh, talking about the uh, Grapes of Wrath in that uh, it shows about the Dust Bowl. Uh, remember the Dust Bowl happening in uh, Oklahoma at the time. Uh, you have this uh, wide-ranging uh, natural disaster that kind of happens over the course of 
eight, nine, ten years and forces a lot of people to leave, to leave uh, Oklahoma and Texas and Kansas and Arkansas and that area. Um, John Steinbeck here uh, is a very famous American author. Uh, he writes uh, other books, uh, Of Mice and Men is another one, Of Mice and Men. But this one here is about, uh, about the 1930s and this movement out west by a family of Okies uh, from Oklahoma who are affected by the Dust Bowl. Uh, remember how I was talking about The Great Gatsby last chapter, I think it was, and I said if you needed to read one book that was about the uh, 1920s, this is the book. Um, this book here is kind of described to be the book of the 1930s, the book of the Great Depression. Uh, sure, there's other books that talk more about other things, uh, but this is probably the most, uh, definitely the most famous one that comes out of the Depression. Uh, he ends up writing this, uh, I believe, in the early 1940s uh, about the experiences of these Okies as they're traveling out west. So uh, it kind of just shows normal Americans and the problems that they're facing at this time. So that's, uh, I think, all I've got to say on that. Um, I think that's all I've got. Yeah, okay. So uh, what we've got to do now, I forgot to mention this yesterday. Um, whenever we do any of these notes, you'll always have some questions to answer on that uh, on the Google Classroom. So I would uh, recommend going there, doing that, um, taking some time and just taking a few minutes and jotting down a couple sentences for each of those uh, questions. Um, tomorrow, like I said, we'll be working on the crossword, but I'll post a video and post uh, kind of an explanation on how to do that. Um, because you won't be able to, unless you print it off and fill it in, you won't be able to fill it in. So I'll give you some explanation on that. But uh, I think that's all I got for today. Um, we are at uh, day three, hoping to add another day tomorrow. So uh, tune back in to find out.